Hi everyone. Um, so yeah, thank you for coming to my talk, The Tale of Phineas Fisher. Um, before I start, I think um, a lot of people have probably heard of Phineas before, but maybe don't know the full story. So I hope I can um, <coughs> go through that today. First of all, uh, who am I? Well, you know I'm Jake. Um, but I also do uh, some stuff with Open Rights Group. Um, I also co-run the Birmingham uh, DEF CON group. And uh, I never, never th thought if I got the opportunity to speak at 44Con, that I'd plug my drum and bass playlist. But uh, that's there too. OK, so those of you that maybe saw the description of this talk, I put a, a little cryptic riddle. Um, so what do, what do all these uh, things have in common? If, you, if your answer was Phineas Fisher, you would be correct. So let's jump in then to the first breach. This is the first breach that was accredited to Phineas Fisher by Phineas Fisher themselves, um, and it was a cause of the attack on Gamma Industries. So here's a quote from Phineas themselves, which they posted in their uh, manifesto. Hacking is a tool. The problem though, right, is that companies like Gamma Labs sell to customers who seek to use hacking to evil ends. <laughs> So why Gamma, why Gamma Industries, right? Why would Phineas target them? So let's go through a timeline of events that might provide some context. So in July, the 20th of July, 2012, Citizens Lab posted a, uh, a report from Bahrain uh, with love. Uh, pro, uh, dem dem democracy activists in Bahrain uh, were targeted using FinSpy, which is the uh, mobile <laughs> spyware uh, produced by Gamma Industries. Then, in, on the 13th of March, 2013, Citizen Lab bring a, another blog out titled, You Only Click Once. <laughs> this, shows, uh, this showed uh, Finfish, uh, Finfisher, uh, which is the, uh, another product by Gamma Industries, uh, being used in 25 countries around the world. Um, as you can see, kind of demonstrated on that graphic there on the screen. Uh, countries such as Ethiopia um, and other, other nations. Uh, okay, sorry. Jumped ahead of myself there. Yep, uh, so there was strong evidence that there was a campaign in Vietnam. Um, of course, Gamma Industries at the time said they only sell to law enforcement and intelligence agencies. They did not comment on the human rights records of the customers of these products. Um, I wouldn't expect them to, but there you go. So, how did Phineas get into Gamma Industries, right? Um, according to Phineas, we have a quote. In the case of Finn Fisher, what led me to the vulnerable Finn support website was a simple who is lookup of the Finn Fisher domain. So that's finnfisher.com. Um, so, what does Phineas do? They do some recon on this support website they found. And they noticed that the developer that made the Finn support website had had previous projects which were open source. And within those projects, they discovered vulnerabilities, one of which was SQL injection. Some of you can probably see where this is going. Using SQL injection then on the fin, fin support website, they were able to gain credentials. They're also, through local file inclusion, able to get the source code of that site just to confirm you know, that things were the same. In this source code, they discover there's an upload function. So Phineas naturally thinks web shell. So after using this functionality to upload a web shell to the, to the service, they discover that the, the, uh, the, the machine is running Debian with no ro local root exploits. So Phineas is in a bit of a pickle as to what to do next. They turn their attention then to other machines so in, in that environment, in that state. This is where they discover a web server offering a folder called QA Team. Hmm, interesting. Upon looking at the... The, uh, the directory, they discover um, a bunch of files related to the QA of the products. Would you believe it? Sorry, my notes are playing up, so I'm having to do this by hand. OK, cool. Is this changing on the screen? <laughs> Fantastic. OK, great. Brilliant. OK. Um, so we have the file called uh, QA Team, which contained FinSpy samples. These were samples 
um, of, the, of, the, of the spyware that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so, of the, the material they're able to access, you've got the QA folder that I just talked about, you have the uh, FinFisher folder, which, can, which uh, had a bunch of products, um, but they are encrypted, so if anyone wants to have a go at those, they are still, this, they are still encrypted to this day, no one has managed to crack them. Um, it's PGP, so, or GPG, sorry, so um, what do you expect? Um, and there was also the dump of the database as well. Um, interestingly enough as well, just a caveat to this as well, is that they discovered uh, support tickets for customers. So they were able to gleam uh, who some of the customers were, um, who were using their products at the time as well. Um, they also taunted Gamma Industries through a, 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 a Gamma Group PR Twitter handle, which I thought was quite funny. Okay, so I mentioned the customers. Here's an example of some of them on the screen. You can see a quote there from Phineas as well. Um, but that kind of wraps up the hack on Gamma Industries. Uh, truth be told, I don't think it was what Phineas was hoping for. But uh, as, we'll, as we'll see, they will make up for that going forward. Okay, so let's move on to the, kind of the, the I think, the turning point in Phineas's sort of career um, as a hacktivist. Um, that was the hacking of Hacking Team, um, an Italian-based uh, company that sold, like Gamma Industries, um, that sold software products to uh, law enforcement, intelligence agencies, uh, you know, kind of anyone who was paying. Um, as you can see there, the quote from Phineas, Hacking Team had very little exposure to the internet. For example, unlike Gamma Group, their customer support site needed a client certificate to, to connect to. That was the, the main site was running Joomla, there was a mail server, a couple of routers, a VPN appliance, and a spam filtering application, or appliance, some sort of sonic wall, something like that. So um, another graph here, you see the use of uh, Hacking Team's uh, product, uh, RCS, Remote Control System. Um, so February, uh, the 12th of February, 2014, uh, Citizen Lab posts um, Hacking Team and the targeting of Ethiopian journalists. In December, uh, the following year, they also po posted a, um, a attacks against ESET employees, um, ESAT, sorry, ESAT employees uh, using the remote control system. So, just like how uh, Gamma Industries started, Phineas had to do some recon, right? They were starting on the outside. So, on the 22nd of May, Phineas began scoping a hacking team, which started by finding their public IP ranges, you can see listed there. Uh, given what we, know, what we know then, smaller attack surface, how did Phineas get into hacking team, right? How, how did they pivot from just IP addresses to actually compromising the company? So let's start with some audience participation, right? Who thinks uh, they know how Phineas got in to hacking team? Um, do we think it's A, a zero day in Joomla? Now, I can't see your hands. <laughs> okay, I think I can. Hands up for A. <laughs> B, do you think it was a zero day in postfix? Any takers? C, a zero day in embedded device? Truth, I can't see anyone's hands. C, the answer was C. So Phineas crafted an exploit for a SonicWall VPN appliance. Um, at the time uh, of, the, of this breach, we didn't actually know that, but I thought it would just be, I'd just put it in uh, to name it so it made sense in the story, as opposed to just kind of an appliance. Um, but yeah, Phineas crafted a remote exploit for that appliance. So now they're on the network. Um, they need to plan their next move, right? So Phineas relies on trusty uh, Nmap uh, and discovers some MongoDB servers. Inside those MongoDB servers are audio files, pictures um, for, for the use of testing of the DaVinci and Galileo platforms. So uh, the products are the part of the remote control system suite. Excuse me. So now they're on the network. They're listening. They're uh, you know doing attacker stuff on the estate. Um, Phineas is, is able to look at documentation, uh, and that's a sample there of the actual documentation the hacking team uh, created and published, stolen by Phineas, obviously, naturally. Um, and so they want to look at the, for the backups right of the organisation. They want to understand what's going on. And that, that, the documentation allegedly says that the backups are segmented, they're not on the same uh, LAN as where Phineas is. That's foreshadowing. Um, so, 
Phineas does some CLI magic and is able to mount the backups that they discovered on one portion of the network to their infrastructure. Through this process, they're able to discover old backups of infrastructure VMs. How nice. One of particular interest was an exchange server from 2014. Using LSDump, Phineas dumps credentials and finds passwords for an admin account uh, for best admin. They then use the new phone credentials, which of course worked on the real estate. So just to add some context, got an old machine from 2014 with cash credentials <laughs> for an old admin account. Phineas uses those cash credentials on the live network to gain an admin account. Fantastic. So uh, you can see here um, a bunch of the passwords that was gathered um, from Phineas's attack. You notice th this is not my uh, annotations, this is all from Phineas in their manifesto, but you can see they point at one of the sysadmin's passwords. Uh, this is an example as well of some of the files that were taken from the organization. There was a whole swath of files, a huge archive, but um, I know you probably can't see that um, in the audience, but there's a directory listing and a bunch of internal files um, and files relating to this individual sysadmins as well, which we'll get to in a second. So um, now Phineas has access to data, has access to particular, ac uh, particular uh, credentials in the estate, but they still don't have what they want which is the source code of the remote control system uh, platforms. So um, remember going back to that documentation, the developer network, the backups are supposed to be segmented. So he needs to hop over, right? they need to find a way to hop over to the other network. Inside uh, the credentials for one of the sysadmins, uh, Christian, Christian Potsy, um, he kept all of the, maybe not all, but a, a, a vast quantity of infrastructure service accounts uh, platform logins in a plain text in, in plain text in a text file on his machine. Um, he also kept other things on his machine as well, like his favourite porn uh, URLs, which he kept on his his desktop in a text file. So you know, each to their own. Um, this is before COVID as well, so he's doing this in the office to for some context. And Phineas also grabbed screenshots as well periodically uh, using PowerSploit, so he was able to piece together um, a bunch of um, a, bu a bunch of different. Um, information on the company that he probably wouldn't have been able to gather and pivot to if uh, uh, Christian didn't keep this in plain text. Um, so Christian Potsy is a, bit of a, is a bit of a villain in the hacking team story. He became, I guess what you could call a fan favorite because he, at the time of the breach, he took to Twitter to defend the company and claiming that they didn't sell spyware and that they were just a software development company. Unfortunately, uh, the onlookers on Twitter didn't take to Cali to this, and uh, yeah, it led to a lot of people laughing at his bad password and uh, his, uh, his work habits. So, um, Phineas now pivots to Christian's machine um, using PowerSploit and a bunch of other living off the land techniques. On his machine, though, he discovers a true crypt archive. Um, so, what does Phineas do? Phineas waits right, for Christian to decrypt the encrypted uh, archive. And then once it's decrypted and mounted, Phineas can grab the files inside. Um, and inside those files was a logon to a NADIOS server. Um, and this was the key. This NADIOS server bridged the two networks. So remember going back, it was supposed to be segmented, but then there was this device in the middle that allowed access to, to both. So this gave Phineas access to the uh, development network, which is what they wanted. This obviously led to the taking of all the source code, right? This is, this is, the, this is the bridge. OK, so that was hacking team. And later in the talk, I will cover um, the aftermath of this and what was kind of the, 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 the wash after this. But uh, we'll move on now to another breach. OK, so after hacking team, Phineas Fisher hacks a Spanish police union. Um, denoted as Mossos. Um, the interesting thing about this breach, though, was that Phineas recorded the entire thing from start to finish. There was obviously prior recon done by Phineas that wasn't recorded, but the bulk of the attack was actually recorded, and you can find the video online on, on YouTube, for example. Um, so what does Phineas do in this attack? So they break into the Mossos website um, via SQL injection. Uh, they, take, they take, obviously, the, the, the database, which contained names, uh, bank details of police staff in this police union, um, and other personal sort of information relating to those officers. 
Um, so after having all this data, they, uh, they start to capture logins as well. So that in the video, um, if you watch it, you can see Phineas uh, edits the login PHP file to actually act as a bit of a cred logger so that he can gather more credentials. I think he thought that he would, they would, sorry, they would get more access if they got an admin account or something. Um, but then, um, whilst going through the database for dumped credentials, uh, they discover that the pa one of the passwords one of the users is using is the same password for their official Twitter account. So Phineas uh, takes a bunch of, uh, I'm going to say alleged images of, of abuse by this police uh, department or union. Um, I can't really confirm that, but this is what it looked like. So they changed the, uh, the banner for this official uh, account to the alleged uh, abuse. Kind of showing sort of Phineas's uh, political leanings there and just kind of, you know, uh, that real sort of hacktivist uh, vein. Uh, and also as well, before they, uh, before they left to exfil the data, they changed the name of the file to index.htm so they could do a little bit of counter forensics, not too much, but just a little bit. Okay, great. So after the police union, there's a period of time, a period of time, sorry, that for the longest time was not really uh, talked about because there wasn't any information. Phineas kind of went dark on this until very recently, well, a couple of years ago, but recently. Uh, it's my favorite part, it's the bank job. So at the time, there was rumors about this, but it wasn't confirmed. And like I said, this is where, for me, the story kind of changes and becomes a bit of a legend, right? Um, this was a uh, post on Reddit at the time, Phineas had a Reddit account, and they, uh, this roughly translates to uh, the banks steal money from the people. Why shouldn't the people steal from banks? And Phineas commented on this post saying that it was an interesting idea. So perhaps this is where they got the inspiration from. So, great. Now, I need to take a little bit of a detour here to explain something that will make sense later on. It's connected to this, but I just thought for the sake of the story, uh, it made sense to do it now. And that is to talk about the Rojava. So um, Phineas really resonated with uh, th these, these people, this, this region. And um, you can see there, I'm going to cover it in a second, but you can see there he talks about donating a lot of money to them. Where did he get the money? Interesting. Um, for those that don't know, uh, the Rojava is a, uh, a communion, a, a, a breakaway state in Syria. It's that green area up there. Um, so the, these are, I just want to say that these are claims made by uh, the group. Uh, I obviously haven't vetted them. I have no ability to vet them, but this is what they say about their own uh, enclave. They say that the PYD officially announced the region, uh, regional autonomy uh, formed the constitution of Rojava. And they list a bunch of social policies that they passed in, the, in that area. Again, a lot of uh, political kind of uh, leanings here and the fact that Phineas um, aligned, aligned themselves uh, to them um, perhaps speaks to Phineas's political aims as a hacktivist. Okay, so for some more context then with the Rojava. Uh, Turkey, not a fan, was not a fan of the Rojava. They claimed that they were an extension of the, Syri uh, of the Kurdish Workers' Party, the PPK. Uh, in the t on the 12th of April, 2016, a Turkish foreign minister called the PYD a terrorist organization in his speech at the uh, uh, Council of Foreign Ministers. 2016 also marked the start of Turkey's strikes against PYD, so Turkey was actively uh, engaged in warfare against the PYD. Uh, interestingly, a few months after this, Phineas breaks in to the email server of the AKP. We'll cover that as well later on. But it just shows there's a, there's a timeline forming here around these particular events. Okay, so let's talk about the bank job then. This was the bank that Phineas hacked, not this literal building, obviously, but the establishment. Um, in November, November, November 17, sorry, 2019, a few years uh, had passed, Phineas publishes a very highly political statement, more so, I think, than any of their other manifestos. If you go back and you look at the designs they posted for Gamma Industries, um, Hacking Team, this one that they posted about the Cayman uh, Bank, National Bank, 
was heavily politically charged, in my opinion. Um, uh, so they say that they stole an undisclosed few hundred thousand uh, pounds. Quite a lot of money. And they say that they used the same exploit that they used to break into hacking teams. So this kind of shows, I think, some sophistication here from Phineas, that the reason why we didn't know for the longest time that they had this exploit is because they were planning on using it, and they did against the Cayman National Bank. So the same smooth wall uh, VPN appliance was targeted, just to clarify. Uh, here's the Bitcoin transaction of Phineas paying Rojava uh, that 100,000, uh, 10,000 euros. Um, you can see that. And here's a, uh, a, cut, f <laughs> here's a cut from the uh, Phineas Manifesto on this breach. I uh, quite like the ASCII, so that's why that's there. So uh, very similar to kind of the TTPs they used in Hacking Team, uh, Phineas uses Met, um, Metasploit to find swift transaction screens. So Phineas was able to get into endpoints of these employees. Um, those fellow people in uh, Blue Team are probably shivering right now that this, this bank didn't detect this. Um, and an interesting thing here, I think, about Swift, which I didn't know until researching this and Phineas touching upon it. So in this particular institution, obviously you can't comment for everyone else in the industry, um, it takes one user to create the Swift message, another user to verify it, and then another user to authorize it. So kind of three points there of verification, authentication, whatever you like. However, this bank, of Cayman International, didn't review those Swift messages. So it wasn't done. So before they could revoke the transfers, once they discovered something had happened, it was too late. The money had already gone. So let's move on then to the, the breach of the AKP, the leading political party in Turkey. I, I love this quote from Phineas. This is kind of like a real sort of like, this is how he felt about it, right? It was a total shit show. Didn't accomplish anything. But the public narrative of what happened is not correct. So what did happen? On the 19th of July, 2016, WikiLeaks released part one. Of a, of a job lot of emails from the AKP. The emails dated back to, to uh, 2010. They did, then did a follow-up post on the 5th of August, 2016, um, with more, more, sort of more, more emails kind of crammed in there. And they came from the uh, official uh, Turkish party domain. Turkey obviously did not like this and blocked WikiLeaks in return from the, the country. Or censored, I guess, would be a better phrase. Um, this is just an excerpt from WikiLeaks about the, the attempted coup that happened in Turkey around about that time. Uh, but WikiLeaks' publishing of this information happened just four days after this coup. So, misunderstanding. That's odd, you can't see it. There's a, there's a clown emoji, but uh, you can't see it on, on the slides. Um, so, in response then to what happened, um, Phineas was, I think, quite angry about this because it looked like they were being shoved in as sort of like a WikiLeaks source, um, which it's apparent they didn't really like. Um, so what was the misunderstanding? So it seems like someone within uh, Rojava accidentally passed on the emails to WikiLeaks. Um, again, this is alleged, right? But it, it, they allege that WikiLeaks took them, published them without asking or confirming they should have been published. Um, and this annoyed Phineas, right? Because at the time, they were still within uh, AKP's network. So the, Phineas is in there doing, doing their thing, right? Looking to maybe do what they've done with similar breaches, but they're immediately burned because the, the, the party's in response kicks in, right? And they're booted off the network. So, um, and he, you know, Phineas is obviously incensed because WikiLeaks, in their opinion, shouldn't have published it, right? They should have respected the wishes of the Rojava and Phineas. Um, so, in kind of response to this, a little bit of a knee-jerk response, Phineas decides, excuse me, Phineas decides to publish a 30-gig archive of what they had already. Unfortunately, uh, in that archive was an entire voter database for this, for this political party. And this, when this kind of happened and press uh, came out about this, the news stories, they framed it as if Phineas had, had done this, for, had hacked the party for the database and that you know, uh, Phineas was like sort of a nation state or something like that, right? But this uh, actual database had been leaked months before by another group not affiliated to Phineas. Um, so 
finish in, the, in their post was trying to point out that they weren't the first there. Okay. So now we've gone through the breaches, right? Quite a fair few of them. Now I want to spend some time looking at the aftermath. What was the aftermath of, uh, of, the, of these breaches? So let's, let's first go catch up with SME or MUSOS. So on the 31st of January 2017, Spanish law enforcement investigating the attack announced three arrests. One of those, they said, was the hacker behind the attack. Hmm, they've caught Phineas. Of course, though, this wasn't Phineas. Uh, what, what came out uh, from Phineas at the time, because they were asked for comment, I think, from Motherboard, uh, it's on the screen, but they said, I think Mossos just arrested some people that retweeted the link uh, to their personal information. So just assuming that you've gone around, they've found three people that have liked the post, linked the post, and they've arrested them. Uh, <laughs> I played. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so the, the next... Uh, the next aftermath I'd like to discuss is a hacking team. This is maybe the best, uh, best maybe defined by uh, the different parties involved, but that's my interpretation. Um, so after the, uh, after the hacking team breach, the FBI uh, got involved. And this, I believe, was caused by uh, the Italian authorities wanting to um, you know, an investigate or, uh, an American citizen. So you think, Phineas, right? They've caught Phineas. But no, it was actually a, an innocent third party, a, a guy called uh, John DeVici. And the, interview, uh, the FBI sorry, interviewed him many times. And he, in his interview, said, I've never even met, I've never heard of Hacking Team. I, you know, I, I don't know who, who Phineas is. Um, you know, what, so what happened, right? How did this guy get thrown into this mix? Well, it was to do with this. Some of you might actually remember this, this Bitcoin gift card or scratch card thing from uh, back in the day. So what had happened was, was that the Bitcoins that were used to purchase the server that Phineas used as a staging environment to compromise hacking team, conduct their, their assault from, um, was paid for with Bitcoin from a service. Um, and it was at this point that Phineas uh, announced that they stole John's Bitcoins to use to buy, to pay for infrastructure, which I thought was kind of cool. And he admitted that to Motherboard in a follow-up uh, interview. But yeah, so John, John Bitcoins were stolen and were used, and the FBI traced it back to the, what they thought was the source, which was the, this John guy. So still, Phineas still not caught. So what happened to the employees of Hacking Team, though? Now, this was a huge, there's, there's a lot, there's a huge spiraling of events after this. There's so much to cover. I can't cover all of it. There's, uh, there's the full, you know, Hacking Team's full uh, emails, right? There's... There's, a bit, there's been uh, a metadata analysis uh, that another third, third party has done where they say that the hacking team used uh, far right or right wing rhetoric to refer to one another. Um, yeah, I'm not going to cover that obviously in too much detail, but you could do another talk just on that if you wanted to. Um, so, what did the foreign employees say? They, they spoke, when they were asked to speak to investigators, um, they hadn't learned anything from the Gamma Labs hacks. They were aware of it in the industry, obviously, but they hadn't done anything, right? Nothing had been done, a hacking team to to kind of show up defenses, to be proactive. Uh, there was a quote from one of the employees that says the company was more worried about selling spyware than keeping hackers away. I think a lot of us in the industry can resonate with that. Um, then we have a direct quote here from a, a kind of a more senior individual, a hacking team. Um, he, he, he was quite open with this, and he, when he was asked, he said that he was told that too much security would hinder development and that uh, the person that hacked Hacking Team must have been a sophisticated group of criminals, which I thought just funny. Uh, Vincent Yeti, the CEO of Hacking Team, um, really kind of fell apart over this, and not sort of in like, you know, what is me, more like a crusade to catch what he thought was a, an inside job. He went ballistic. He started to accuse former employees, uh, which is some really sad stories about because he, you know, he, chased, he pursued them legally. These people that were innocent, but he went after them anywhere. He referred to them as infidels and traitors. Um, presented this in Italian court, as I mentioned, to which though a judge, you know, sort of uh, laughed him out of the courtroom by saying, "It's clear that such theory is completely groundless." <laughs> so it's funny. Even the judge is like, "No, you're wrong." 
So what was the truth then? What was the, what was the reason perhaps why, other than his company being breached, why was David so, so angry? Well, the facts. He was salty, right? It had been exposed to everyone that he was the reason why key parts of the infrastructure, like that sonic wall appliance we spoke about earlier, weren't updated. He would refuse to let IT update this infrastructure. Um, he wanted to use his legacy VPN, and that's what they did. They, they, you know, he used it. He also then started a witch hunt, right? As I mentioned earlier, he went after foreign employees. He ruined foreign employees' lives uh, legally to, get, you know, to try and get to this narrative of that people had been plotting against him and that this breach was them enacting that plot. So in December, the 11th of December, 2017, um, the, a Milan-based prosecutor assigned to the hacking team breach files with a judge uh, a motion to stop the investigation. Phineas had gone away with it. In July 2018, an Italian judge rules the investigation into what happened to hacking team and who was responsible was to be shut down. There were no leads. Uh, the investigator said that Phineas must have been part of an organisation that was scientifically and maniacally used, and maniacally used techniques to evade identification. Sounds like a cool story to me. Uh, in June of 2019, Joseph Men, a kind of renowned um, cybersecurity writer, commenter, um, bring, brought out a book, uh, The Cult of the Dead Cow. Um, and in this book, he uh, has a quote from a, a U.S. source, a US, sorry, a source in the U.S. government, uh, that they allege that Phineas was a, a likely a Russian operative. Um, some sort of like Guccifer 2.0, you know, it's like GRU op. However, another source that was commented uh, by Motherboard, or, sorry, was sourced by Motherboard, had said that actually the US government believe that Phineas is a hacktivist. They don't believe them to be um, a nation state at all. So, what else did Phineas get up to after these breaches? Well, they launched a hacker bug bounty program. Um, I don't know how well that comes across to the audience, but as you can see, some Phineas put this in their last sort of announcement in which they disclosed the, the Cayman International uh, bank breach, they also launched a bug buying program offering $100,000 to people that can hack uh, companies and expose data in these industries, gas, oil, big pharma, you know, kind of get the picture. And someone actually did. Somebody hacked Milico and then received 10000 from the uh, from, the, from the bounty. That's, the ASCIA is not me. That was created by the attackers of Milico in their manifesto. So, that's the, after, that's, that's the legacy. That's the aftermath. Since then, Phineas has been quiet, deadly silent. There has been no new posts, no uh, breaches attributed to them by themselves. There's been, been nothing. Um, I think they even announced to Motherboard that they were, they were taking some time off for stress in 2019. However, fast forward to August 22, uh, 20, 2022, sorry. Um, this happened. This is a screenshot from a video of a hacktivist group, does it sound familiar? That went after Guatemala's Ministry of Natural Resources, a, a hydro a carbons uh, agency in Colombia, and a bunch of other oil and mining uh, conglomerates in Brazil, Venezuela, Chile, and Colombia. Um, Unlike Phineas, this group recorded their entire, their entire breach of this company uh, through exploitation, uh, all the way across the attack chain. They recorded the entire thing. And this is purely speculation, but to me, the TTPs used by this group are very, very similar to Phineas. Obviously, I can't say with confidence this, this breach was Phineas, but I think it goes to show regardless that Phineas had a lasting effect, and I think always will have a lasting effect on hacktivism. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe, maybe it is them, maybe it's not. We'll find out, I guess, in time. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming to my talk with Felice Fisher. You can find me. Thank you. We have time for uh, maybe two questions, if there are any. Or you can always find our uh, fantastic speakers meandering around. Um, if there are no questions, then it's lunch. Oh, we got a question. Yep. Yeah, <clears throat> I was in Italy and was following all this hacking team stuff, the, the company in Milan. That, and I think maybe one of the reasons the, the prosecution was halted 
against yeah. is because I think the Italian government may have been one of the customers, right? I of, think so. of, of the thing. But they, they shut down the company because also in that period, in the news, that was in the main news, Italy had a, a problem, big problems with uh, Egypt because they kill an Italian citizen in a so and also Egypt used that software and there was a big like and they wanted to shoot that investigation and shoot that the company and everything around that. So I'm, I'm, I'm not pressure. super confident on that, but that's my yeah. my yeah conclusion. Well, thank thank you for context. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, thank just, you. Just comment. Yeah. All right, here we go. Uh, so, are there any hints to where they? So, at the end, they're offering a bug bounty program. Yeah. So, at some point, they must have acquired a bit of a war chest. Any hints on what operations that was? Uh, yeah. So, the money, it's in theory, came from Cayman National Bank, right? They don't yeah. disclose the full amount, but they, they they took, as they say, a few hundred thousand. Was your question say where the money came from? Well, it's but you said that transfer didn't actually work, or how do you? So it's one thing, where, where do you put that money afterwards? Oh, you mean where did they put the money when they took it from the bank? Yeah, good question. I don't know, I'm not finished, right? But uh, yeah, they, 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 um, they took the money, they filtered it. I th actually, I think... Uh, so it's, they it's a whole different thing, that being transferred somewhere yeah, yeah, and then yeah. that going so, into a Bitcoin war chest. They yeah, yeah, yeah. Or not. Let me clarify. It wasn't a direct transfer from the bank to, like, to Bitcoin, right? They took the money to an account... Um, You've, you've jogged my memory now. Yeah, so they, they, took it to, they, they sent it to an account. I think the first time they did it, they sent it to the wrong account. Um, it went through a bank in England as opposed to a bank in South America, I think. And then eventually it went through the right, the right way, routed to their account, and then they, they took it. But like I said, there is a write-up. I can share it with you after this. There's an e-sign that covers this maybe in more detail that I couldn't fit into the slides. But yeah, yeah, good question. But yeah, they, they funneled the money away and then, ex then exchanged it into Bitcoin or part of it, whatever they did. Great. Much everyone.